Today, I will give you an insight into the function and operation of one of our larger measurement devices, the LSC. LSC stands for Liquid Scintillation Counter. In German, it's Flüssig Scintillationszähler. We will discuss what scintillation is later. As with any measurement device, it requires calibration standard. In this case, we have tritium, carbon-14 and a background solution. 4167 becquerels of H3 and 1667 becquerels of carbon-14 are contained in these 20 milliliter solution in the form of labeled toluene. So either the carbon in C7H8 is radioactive or the hydrogen is. The activity of hydrogen is now significantly lower, but I don't know when they were purchased, so I can't calculate that. Before the standards or any other sample can be placed in the sample tray, it must be ensured that these vials are not contaminated from the outside. Radioactive contamination would be particularly bad because it would make the measurement results completely unusable. Therefore, all the vials are always thoroughly cleaned with ethanol, especially at the top and the bottom where the gripping arm attaches. The clean tray can now be placed into the measurement device with the clean vials. So now we have successfully started a measurement, but what happens inside? First, a gripping arm uses negative pressure to pick up the lid of one of these vials and put them into the measurement chamber. There, three photodiodes are positioned at 120 degrees to each other. Each sample consists of radionuclide that decays somehow and a scintillation cocktail that was pre-mixed in these standards. The scintillation cocktail is a mixture of including a liquid scintillator, which looks something like this, and a bunch of various additives that increase the solubility of the mostly aqueous sample because the liquid scintillator is a non-polar substance and the cocktail is usually also based on aromatic solvents. We have our radioactive decay in the mixture, a solvent molecule is then excited and through the exchange of virtual photons, the energy is transferred to the scintillator molecules. V virtual what? The energy is transferred from solvent to scintillator and it's often for simplicity's sake explained as a collision. But that's not the case. It's not really a collision. The two particles come very close and then the interaction occurs transferring energy through a so-called virtual photon. But I also find it completely understandable if you describe this interaction as just a collision, even though it doesn't reflect the truth. That subject is already complicated enough, <laughs> just as a side note. The scintillator now releases an excess in energy in the form of light. A photomultiplier tube amplifies the signal, which is then processed by the software and it's important that the number of photons is proportional to the energy of the beta particle, not the wavelength. The wavelength of the photons depend on the scintillator. In this case, it's in the UV range. I'll come back to that shortly. When all three detectors simultaneously register light, we call this a triple coincidence, a clear indication of a radioactive decay. These triple coincidences are particularly evident with carbon-14, which has a maximum beta energy of 156 kilo electron volts. The energy is sufficient to achieve good triple coincidences. The spectrum we can see here corresponds to a classical beta spectrum. The LSC has a maximum efficiency of up to 100% for betas. The gammas of an LSC sample pass right through the cocktail without noticeable interaction, but they can still disrupt the measurement through the photoelectric effect if, for example, a gamma calibration standard is right next to the device. Alphas can also be measured with the device, but but we don't do that. Additionally, it requires extra software, which we don't have. So it's possible, but we don't do it here. Thus, the LSC is the only device with which we can record beta spectra. Let's look at the spectrum of tritium. We can see that this is significantly spread out in the low energy range. This is due to the maximum energy of only 19 kilo electron volts. The energy of the beaters is sometimes not sufficient to ultimately generate strong enough light signals for all three detectors to register them. This leads to an increase in double coincidences. Now, this part is only important for those who really want to understand how to operate this device and learn about the effects during the measurement. How do you start this measurement? The software is called MicroWin. First, a parameter must be selected. This parameter gives the device a rough idea of what kind of sample are in there. For example, is it a 20 milliliter vial or a 5 milliliter vial? Let's name our measurement. Now we have recorded the screen with a long-term lutetia measurement, but that's trivial to be honest. 
Measurement time 120 seconds, activity low to make the measurement more accurate. Only use high activity for standard samples for example. Now we gotta select where are our samples in the tray, then the ROI can be adjusted depending on the nuclide, but you can leave it as it is. For type it's beta, you get the beta counts, and for beta triple you get the triple coincidences separately. There are 1023 measurement channels and it will automatically correct the number if you accidentally enter too many. Under advanced options you will find the tray delay, which is how long the tray sits in the dark without being measured to let photoluminescence decay. 15 minutes is sufficient. This is crucial because photoluminescence is, if you have worked cleanly, the biggest interference factor. It takes 24 hours to get rid of the chemiluminescence, that would be even better, but only if you have the time. Ionizer delay describes when the airflow comes to deionize the vial. Electric charges could cause unwanted light pulses. A chamber delay, which is how long the vial sits in the measurement chamber after being placed in there by the grappling arm. Once everything is set under measurement data, click and correctly name the fields. Under parameters, do not exclude raw export driver and spectra data. And once all the delays are finally over, you will get the first results under results. Moving on to some additional effects. There are other reasons beside low beta energy, as it was the case with tritium, that can lead to a increase in double coincidences. Remember the software? You could specify a cooldown time, i.e. how long the sample remains in a dark detector without being measured. Sample preparation takes place in a lab where the light is still on all the time and it can already excite the scintillator. Therefore you should wait or work in a dark room if you can to avoid the fluorescence influencing the spectrum. Further information you should know, if not 100% of the energy from the decay is indirectly converted into light, we talk about a quench, an effect that leads to a reduction in the light in the LSC. There are different types, the chemical quench, where the solvent does not transfer the energy to the scintillator, solvents with a high minus I effect such as brominated or nitrated solvents do this. There is also a physical quench, if there is dust in your sample, the energy transferred to the scintillator can be disturbed or the light emitted can also be absorbed by dust particles before reaching the detector or the beta particle directly can hit the dust particle. And then there is the color quench. I mentioned a few minutes ago that the scintillator emits in the UV range. That's bad if the photomultiplier has an absorption maximum in the visible range. Therefore there is a secondary scintillator in the cocktail. The secondary scintillator or wavelength shifter ensures that the photons emitted by the primary scintillator fall within the correct wavelength range for the photomultiplier. Stokes shift is the technical term for this. If these photons are then shifted to a wavelength of about 500 to 600 nanometers and the solution itself also absorbs in this range, you can see that some photons are absorbed. These are all the effects that are relevant when doing an LSC measurement. So this video was intended for everyone who wanted a general overview of the LSC and the second part was more like for these who actually plan to using this device someday. But I don't, I don't want to damage such an expensive piece of equipment. <laughs> A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.